Around 1975, I picked up painting again. After watching Bill Alexander on PBS, I built a little studio in the basement and started painting one night a week. After a while, I built a bigger studio, as you can see here with my dad. This is so that I can invest more time in experimenting and do larger paintings. At this particular time, I also picked up an airbrush and taught myself how to use it. Only at first to do clouds and such, but basically I, was a, I started out as a brush painter. Pretty soon that airbrush just took over. It just took over everything. One day, one of my fellow students from Parkside saw me at a store and asked me if I was still doing the surrealistic paintings that I was doing out at Parkside. And I said, no, not really. She says, well, can I come over and see your artwork sometime? I said, well, sure, come over anytime. Matter of fact, you can come over right now. And she did. She followed me home. And uh, she walked into the studio that we have on the back of the garage. And when she saw what I was, what I was doing, she just kind of grabbed her chest and went kind of backwards on her heels. And she says, wow, this is not what I expected. And after looking at it for a while, she said, I've never seen anything like this before. You know, you should enter this in Wisconsin watercolors. I work over there every once in a while, and I, and I think that this would really fit in really well. And I says, well, okay, let's, let's give it a shot. So I guess Beverly Coleman Hayes was the one who really got me started on the show circuit. The painting Vis-a-Vis, -vis, along with Iolian Courier, were entered in that show. I believe it was Vis-a-Vis -vis that won the Merit Award that, that year, my first award, and it just was very encouraging for me to go on and continue on. And after that, I entered Wisconsin Watercolors probably for about the next 10 or 15 years. But I found out that I was in a category known as automobile fine art, which I didn't know. There were other artists that were doing the same thing, and I did meet them over time. Automobile fine art. This turned out to be a great fit for me because of my love for painting and my love for cars. Instead of painting whole cars, I focused on the abstract reflections of just certain parts of the body and the grills. I could let my imagination go wild in the reflections, often telling a story in the content. I became quite well known, which led to future articles, covers, and well-known car magazines. Interviews and other things that were going on in the automobile industry, I was seeming to get involved with, being asked by other people to come and talk with them and show them what I've been doing. Pretty soon I became internationally known because of the shows that I was doing, as well as many commission paintings for people from all walks of life. When I would do commission work, I loved putting the cars in context with the people's lives, putting in details or reflections of memories of the good times in their lives when they had the car, just to personalize it. This led to doing less art shows and art fairs and more car shows. I'd often be the featured artist at high-profile shows that would draw international attention with big names and car people and marks. The real cream of the collectors and the customizers and other well-known automobile fine artists. I was awarded the Automobile Artist of the Year Award in 1997 and won the Par Excellence Award from the EAA Aviation Foundation in 1994 in their art competition. Painting the B-50 is the only automobile that ever won an international aviation art show. In 2001, I retired from Unico but continued to work for them three years as a contract. I was still doing car shows on every weekend. 20 plus years of working full-time job and often being away from the family on weekends led to some disenchantment with the whole scene. In 2006, a comment that a friend and customer Dan Balthy said to me, he says, Tom, when are you going to ever just stop doing these shows on the weekend and just sitting in your yard and watch the grass grow? Well, I had a good laugh about that, and he kind of winked and had a good laugh about it. And then a week later, he died. And when that happened, I started thinking what he said. It was like this wasn't coming out of his mouth. I think this was coming from the mouth of God that it was time for me just to settle down, move back, and take it easy, and see what's going on. And I did. And at that time, I just quit doing all the car shows. I quit doing paintings. And once again, uh, my whole art life just stopped. About a year later, I met an old friend. And he was doing a show on television called Way Out Willard's Wild World of Automobiles, or something like that. I can't remember. It was a long title. 
And he asked me if I would help produce the show for him and, and film. He knew I was into film. I said, well, sure, I'm not doing any artwork and doing car shows anymore. He says, but you don't? I says, no. I says, I'm just kind of putting that on the back burner. And he says, well, let's do car shows. <laughs> and I says, well, what do you mean? He says, well, let, I want to go out and film car shows and go out the drag strip and film out the drag strip. If you want, you can come along with me. And, and we'll only go out once a week. I thought, well, I could probably do that. And I said, okay, let's give it a try. So we tried it once. I really, really liked it. We went out to the drag strip, and I hadn't been out to the drag strip since the, the early 60s. And we filmed cars out there and, and interviewed famous people. And, and I came back, and I edited it, and I spent probably three or four days just on editing the whole show, submitted it to the television, and got great reviews on it. People just really, really liked it. So I became a producer, a television producer. I learned a whole lot of editing by the seat of my pants and a lot of video work, which I never thought I would do. Did you ever try to film a, a dragster going 280 miles an hour down a drag strip in a blink of an eye? Well, I had to learn how to do that. So I got into film. Film is another form of art, and I really enjoyed it, and I still do. I still do a lot of filming. This is Tom Peterson, a.k.a. Uncle Tom from Uncle Tom's Kitchen. Well, we're doing another show, as you remember, oh, last month we did a show on Habitat Humanity for the volunteer series that we're doing, Volunteers Every Scene. Now, because of that, we found another person. As you can remember, Harold Solberg is a person that, there goes a squirrel. Has, <laughs> there has a pers is a person that actually started the Habitat Restore, him and his wife, Lois, in Racine. And I found out that he's a bowl maker. He makes bowls out of wood. And what an artist he is. Beautiful work. We're going to see a little bit of his work. Take a look at this once. Hi, Harold Solberg. And uh, I'm demonstrating today turning buckthorn. The, the technical term is called chatoyance. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Is that, that Indian? That flash in the wood. Oh. Yes, in my rod. Can you give me a ride, man? Yeah, come on, dude. Hop in my car. We'll head down to my crib and we'll check it out. Okay, cool, man. Thanks a lot. You live here, bro? Yeah, you got a problem with that? Well, no, as long as you got a fall, but you live in a chicken coop? While I was doing the Way Out Willard show, I decided uh, that I would like to do a cooking show because I really enjoyed cooking, too. I started doing a cooking show, and we called it the Uncle Tom's Kitchen. And basically, I wanted to do is teach guys how to cook. It was a, it's a, it was a guy show. My whole idea here was getting guys to eat more healthy food because most of the guys, all they do is just run to get a burger or wherever to get something fast food place. I was showing them how, how much fun it is. And I would throw in some of the movies and some of the photographs that we shot out at the drag strip or at the car show. And by golly, that show caught on too. And they wanted more and more of them, so I started producing more. And I did Uncle Tom's Kitchen probably for three years on television. And during the last part of the three years that I was doing it, I had my granddaughter Bella come in. And when she was probably just able to talk, she came in and uh, started doing some shows with me. And she was the cutest thing. And this is a special kind of cheese, Bella. I'm going to ask you something. I'm going to ask you about this cheese. I'm going to say, this is Chihuahua cheese. And I'm going to say, Bella, where does Chihuahua cheese come from? And you say, those little Chihuahuas. Oh, that's what you have to say. Those little Chihuahuas, OK? Chihuahuas. Little Chihuahuas. Ch chihuahuas. You say? Ch chihuahuas. Little, going to go like this. Little Chihuahuas. Chihuahuas. Little Chihuahuas. Chihuahuas. And you know what? Chihuahuas. Bella, you know what? This cheese, this is Chihuahua cheese. Where does Chihuahua cheese come from? Come from. You say, from little chihuahuas. Little. Little chihuahuas, say it. Say little dogs, okay? Little dogs. Okay, okay. And this is the chihuahua cheese. And Bella, where does chihuahua cheese come from? It comes from a king say where it from. Okay, you say little dogs. That's all you have to say is little dogs. Little dogs. Okay. And here is the chihuahua cheese. And where does chihuahua cheese come from? In 
in there. <laughs> We're never going to get this done. You just say little dogs. That's all you have to say is little dogs. That's all you have to say. Okay, here we go again. And Bella, this is Chihuahua cheese. And where does Chihuahua cheese come from? It comes from in there. It comes from the little dogs. <laughs> now I'll do it again. I'll say little dogs. That's all you got to say is little dogs. Grandpa's going to say, where does Chihuahua cheese come from? And you say little dogs. And look up at the camera. And Bella, this is Chihuahua cheese. And where does Chihuahua cheese come from? It comes from dogs. Those little bitty dogs? Yeah. Where did you learn that? On the internet? Yeah. Oh, you can't believe everything you hear on the internet. So we have the Chihuahua cheese here. So retired, I even got busier than ever doing the Wild Willard show, the Uncle Tom's Kitchen. And then in 2008, I started recording the Sunday services at Racine Bible Church. I also put those on the television and for people in Racine who might be shut-ins or not being able to go to the service. In June of 2011, three days after I thought I had pains in my shoulder from arthritis, Dory took me to the ER thinking that I was having a heart attack. They didn't think so and they were about ready to send me home and suddenly I flatlined and went into seizures. They brought me back to life after 10 minutes of work. They put in a stent and I was in the hospital for a week. Sent home to get stronger and scheduled for it to come back in a month for a triple bypass which turned out to be a quadruple bypass during the surgery. Needless to say, I dropped the Wild Willard show and doing car shows. I dropped Uncle Tom's Kitchen sometime later in that year, but continued to do the RBC services and expanding to distributing the DVD services to several local nursing homes and residents who couldn't get out to see the services. In 2012, my cousin Shirley said that I should get back into painting, and she took me to my first geezer meeting on a Wednesday morning. This dragonfly painting that's in the back here was my first effort. I painted one side of it, airbrushed it, and then tried to start painting the left-hand side. My mind could see what I was supposed to draw or paint on the other side, but my hand would not let me do it. It was almost like I had a stroke in my brain and I wasn't able to do what my brain was telling me to do. I thought, there's something wrong here and I have to really work at it. The geezers were very, very encouraging. When I went there and I told them about that, they just says, well, just keep at it and work harder and harder at it, which I did, just trying to get my mind and my hand coordinated again. And this is the result. I did do it. I got it through, and it took me probably a month just to do that part of the painting. You know, how many times can you erase a dragonfly and without, you know, burning a hole in the paper? It was, it was getting pretty bad, but I did get through it. And after that, I just felt like I could paint again, and I did. And I'll tell you, the geezers were the ones who really pulled me through this really hard time in my life. Another friend of mine says, well, listen, why don't you try painting something with cars again? And I said, I don't want to do that anymore. He said, but I got a truck, and all I want you to do is to just take a piece of the chrome that's on the car that says Apache on it and paint a scene in it. And right away I had a vision. I had a vision of an Apache, an Indian, and he was reflected in the chrome with the teepees and a scene in the background. I said, okay, I'll do it. And for the next month I was painting a piece of chrome. And I was really enjoying it. So slowly but surely, I'm getting back into art. Uh, my cousin Terry came along on the scene. He was a retired art professor from uh, Rochester, Minnesota. And he, told, he started teaching me more and more about abstract art again and how much fun it is to paint with a stick and just taking a whole bunch of paint and putting it down on a canvas and then just moving it around with a, just with sticks that you find on the ground and paint instead of paintbrushes using leaves. And I was giggling like a little kid. This was so much fun. Sooner or later, I just started working more and more in abstract art, just letting my, my hands do what my mind was seeing, you know, and... And then I learned how to do uh, pour paintings. I don't know if you know what pour painting is, but this is uh, a video of me doing a pour painting that we did for the, uh, the for RAG, for the show downtown at the Starving Artist Fair. I was doing the tabletop. 
sometimes I just didn't stop with the poor painting because I would look at it and I look at it and I would see like creatures in the poor and I thought, hey, maybe I can bring those out. So I started bringing them out with pencil, started bringing them out with paint, I started bringing them out with ink and it was I was just having a great time. I was learning from a fellow by the name of Peter Draws. That's not his name, but it was Peter, and his show was called Peter Draws. And it was all about letting your mind go and just doodling. And I thought, doodling, I like doodling. I used to love to doodle. I doodled all over my notebooks all the time. And I started doodling. I started seeing these little creatures and whatever was inside these poor paintings and started bringing them out. Had fun. You'll see some of those here, too.